Greetings and welcome back. In this video we're going to take a look at creating documents inside of Photoshop. Now if you are using Photoshop primarily as an image editor and you're not creating a lot of original work, well, then you may not see this window nearly as often, but it's important that you know what, you, what you're looking at when you're inside here. So I'm going to go under File and jump into New. And let's just take a quick look. A lot of these are pretty self-explanatory and I imagine you know what a lot of them are just by looking, but if you're completely new there are a few things in here that might throw you for a loop if you're unfamiliar with them. So first off, we have the name. I highly recommend you name all of your new documents and having said that, I practically never name my new documents. Uh, this is just a nice way that you could go ahead and say, you know, this is my new document and you can name this anything you want. Of course, you can probably a good idea to name it after whatever it is you're about to be creating. The good thing about doing this is you can just go ahead and hit file and save and the name will already be in place. But if you forget to do this, you can always name the file when you save it. Now next, we have some presets that allow us to choose the output that we're going to be working with. Uh, the general idea for uh, Photoshop, at least when it started, was for print. Of course, as the, the years progressed, web became a lot more important. So you kind of have to think about what it is you want to be doing. Are you creating an image that will be up on a website? Are you creating an image that you're going to feed through your printer and, and you're going to be printing it up big, small, what are you going to be doing? So you have some standards for US paper. So there's your standard 8.5 by 11 uh, with a resolution of 300. Now I'm going to switch this back over to Photoshop's default size and we'll move down from here. The thing you do need to keep in mind though is that you can create your own presets. So if you have a particular width and height that you'd like to use in particular, uh, you can set all of that up and then click Save Preset, give it a name, and it'll appear in this preset list. If you have a fancy printer installed, and I'm not going to go into which printers are fancy and which ones aren't, but I do want to mention that certain printers will go ahead and install new presets into this so that uh, once once you come over here to your presets, you may see other paper sizes depending on what printer you have attached to your computer right now. Now, moving down from here, we have some settings for the width and the height of our document. We can set this numerically, and then we can choose what our measurement uh, factor is. Are we measuring this out in inches, centimeters, millimeters, points, picas, or columns? Or if you're doing something for web, for gaming graphics, or for anything on a computer, it's generally a good idea just to work in pixels. So 7 by 5 inches translates over to 504 by 360 pixels when measured at a resolution of 72 pixels per inch. And that's where things get a little bit math involved. So if you're, uh, if you're totally new to this, this is where you go, wait a minute, what's all this about? The resolution of your document is probably the most important thing to keep in mind uh, in terms of what your output is going to be. The second most important is going to end up being your color mode. And uh, followed very closely by your color profile, but we're not going to talk too much about that. So let's just take a look. Starting uh, at the very top here, you've already seen width and height. We can set that in pixels. And so currently, as you saw, if I switch this to inches, you'll see this is 7 by 5. If I switch it back over to pixels, you'll see that we get these nice uh, different numbers. But watch this. If I switch this over to inches, but I change my resolution to 150, which is kind of a, uh, a medium resolution for print, then if I switch back over to pixels, notice we now have 1,050 pixels by 750 pixels. That's because what you're doing is you're controlling how many of those pixels will be placed within each inch of your document. Now, the, I don't want to really beat the dead horse too badly on that. Generally, you're going to be working in pixels per inch if you're in uh, the States. Uh, outside of the United States, you may be working in pixels per centimeter, but we're just going to stick with uh, pixels per inch for our discussion. And if you want to stick with inches, that's fine. Just be very aware, whenever you're using anything other than pixels in this measurement, be very aware of your resolution. Now, all of that said, you saw earlier that the default was a resolution setting of 72. 72 pixels per inch is the standard for a computer screen. So for anything digital, it's only going to be displayed on a monitor. 72 pixels per inch is generally what you're going to be working with. Now, as you increase this, and you can, you can put any number you want in here, but the big numbers that you're going to use more often than anything are 150 for a low-resolution print or 300 for a standard commercial-grade print. So if you're going to be sending something off to a printer or you're printing something off your own computer and you want it to look uh, extra super nice, be sure that your resolution is set to 300 pixels per inch. 
If you're completely new to Photoshop, this is why sometimes when you open up a, uh, a JPEG image that you downloaded off the internet and you print it, it sometimes appears either extremely small or very, very chunky, and it just looks nasty when you print it. Uh, that's because the resolution is probably not what you think it is. Even a very big image on your computer screen will translate to a much smaller image in print, because think about it. On your screen, you've only got 72 pixels per inch. On print, you have 300, so that's like, what, four times as many or, or eight times as many if you want to multiply it out in both directions. It's several times larger when you uh, switch it over to a resolution of 300, so be aware of that. And again, your big numbers that you're going to be reaching for more often than anything else are 72 for your computer screen, and generally I only stick with 300 for print, so just be aware of that. Next, we have our color mode. Now, there are... Several options in here. We have bitmap, grayscale, RGB color, CMYK color, and lab color. The two I really want to focus on right now are RGB color and CMYK color. And the easy way to remember the difference between the two is that RGB is going to be used for a computer monitor, and CMYK is for print. Now, RGB stands for red, green, and blue, which is the primary colors of light, also the color of each one of the pixels on your monitor. Uh, you can also choose the color depth, which can be in 8-bit, 16-bit, or 32-bit. For our purposes, we will be using primarily either 8-bit or 16-bit. We really don't need to be going into 32-bit, at least for the time being. Now, moving down from here, the other important one I mentioned was CMYK color. That stands for cyan, magenta, yellow, and key, which is also black. Uh, the term, or the acronym, comes from the four-color printing press, which, when it's printing things like uh, magazine spreads and whatnot, uses one plate that contains all of the, uh, all the information for where cyan is going to be placed, for magenta, for yellow, and then finally, black, and the reason it's got a K and the reason it's, it's called key is that all three of the other colors are generally set and aligned with where the blacks are. So it's kind of like black is the most important color, so it's called the key. And so instead of having CMYB, you have CMYK. All right, so again, the big difference here, RGB is for what? Yes, a computer screen, and CMYK color is for a printer. So if you know you're going to be printing, you might as well go ahead and switch it over to CMYK. I do want to throw this out there. Certain functions within Photoshop, especially when you start digging through filters and whatnot, uh, will not work inside of CMYK color. So if you're ever trying to perform any operation that you see me doing inside of Photoshop, but it's grayed out inside the menu, odds are, and there's there are a few exceptions, but odds are that your color mode is set to something other than what I have. And I'll give an example of that here in just a moment. Moving down from here, we have our background contents. This is basically what color your paper is going to be. Do you want it to be white? Do you want it to be whatever the background color is currently set to? Which in my case, if we look down here in the lower left-hand corner of the screen, my background color is white, incidentally. But if it was set to something else, it would uh, take on that color. Or we can set the background contents to transparent. And that's kind of like working on a great big sheet of transparency film. And then uh, you can just build up from there. Now, down underneath here, we have the advanced area, and this allows you to choose your color profile. Now, color profiling could really be its own lecture, so I'm going to keep this very, very simple. You have several different uh, color profiles that apply to different types of paper. So, you know, if you're actually go trying to create something that will go on newsprint, you could choose the U.S. newsprint uh, snap profile. 99 times out of, uh, out of 100, for the most part, you're just going to be working with uh, the default that's included here, which is going to be the working CMYK. If you're using CMYK, if you're using RGB, it's going to be sRGB. So that's kind of all you really need to know there. But again, I don't want to turn this into a great big long lecture over color profiling. Down from here, we have the pixel aspect ratio. This really isn't anything you're going to want to play with too terribly often unless you're doing a, a specialty output. Like in this case, if we expand it, you'll start to see what some of these are, such as digital video for NTSC, etc. and so forth. This basically takes the pixels and gives them a different aspect ratio so that your image will work very well with that particular video format. But really, for the most part, you're going to be fine just using square pixels. So unless you already know that you need to change this, you can leave it alone. It's one of those things where I mean, I know it sounds bad, but if you don't know what these are, then you can just leave it at square pixels because that means you're not working with DV, uh, NTSC, PAL, uh, DVC Pro, and so on and so forth.
So that's a quick rundown of all of the options available here inside the new document window. The last thing I want to kind of just generally mention is you also have this button sitting over here that you've probably been dying to click on called Device Central. And what this is, is a separate application that pops up inside of Photoshop that allows you to emulate different types of devices to see how any particular image you're working with would appear when uh, rendered out through Flash on those devices. And we're going to go ahead and just close that off. It's not something I really want to tear into right now. Let's go back over to new. And then finally, once we've got everything we want in terms of our width, our height, our resolution, our color mode, and so forth, we can just click OK and we get our brand new document. So that is a look at creating our new document, but that's really not where I wanted to end the video. I know we're 10 minutes in and I know I've just gone through all of these different settings, but there's a couple more things I did want to mention uh, that I think are extremely useful. You'll notice by default when you create a new document that it appears as a tab here inside of Photoshop. Now I could make this into a work of art real quick and grab my color swatch, choose some obnoxious shade of purple and draw something. It almost doesn't really matter what. Let's hit the B key to grab my paintbrush and then I'm just going to draw a smiley face. So there's this amazing work of art that uh, we definitely want to save. But if I go to File, New, and I create a new document now and click OK, notice that the new document appears as another tab. So we can jump back and forth between the two by clicking on each one of those tabs. Also, there's some information displayed to you at the top that you ought to be aware of. You get the name of the document. You get a zoom factor. So this is being viewed at 100%. If I change this over down here in the lower left-hand corner of the view, I can set this to 50%. So we can, we can zoom out on it. So it's much smaller. Now you'll notice this changes to the name of the document at 50%. It also gives you the color mode and the color depth. So this is an RGB document currently at 8-bit. Now, you'll also see on one of these documents, there's a little tiny floating star. It's like an asterisk. That is telling you that changes have been made to this document that have not yet been saved. Generally speaking, that asterisk should scare the daylight out of you. I would love it if that became your habit. If every time you saw that star, your breath caught in your chest, you panicked a little, and you lunged for Control S or File Save to make sure you save your changes. Because there's nothing more frustrating than losing a whole bunch of work uh, because of a power outage or because, heaven forbid, Photoshop should crash for some reason. Who knows why you know the application could suddenly stop working. Somebody could walk up and just unplug your computer. Uh, but if you've saved, it's not a big deal. And that little asterisk right there is Photoshop's way of reminding you that you have not saved any of your changes, or you haven't saved recently anyway. Now, if you don't like this tabbed style of interface, if you don't like seeing all of your windows pop up, maybe you're a Photoshop CS, I want to say, I think it was three, uh, where they, they weren't doing this. I think they only started using the tabbed interface as of four. I'm pretty sure that's the case, but honestly, all of the different uh, CSs kind of blur together for me. You can drag these out, and like the uh, the nature of the entire Photoshop workspace, you have a lot of customizability. So you can just pull these tabs off and you can position this anywhere you want. This is now its own little floating window. It could go over on another monitor, which I won't do because you guys couldn't see it anyway. And then you can, of course, drag it back up in here and dock it. You can also rearrange the order of these little tabs just by dragging them around like so. The reason I bring this up is that once you really get into working with Photoshop and using multiple layers, and maybe you're, you're just doing a whole bunch of different things, you're probably going to want to transfer bits and pieces from one document to another. Let me give you an example. Now, if you're totally, you know, you're a raw recruit and you're kind of terrified by what Photoshop's go, uh, showing you right now, I'm going to do this really slowly so that you can follow along if you want to. I am currently using the Essentials workspace, so make sure you click on that and then click on the little double arrow and click Reset Essentials one more time just to make sure that everybody sees pretty much the exact same thing. In the lower right-hand corner of the view, we have the Layers panel, and at the bottom of that, second from the end, we have the New Layer button. It looks like a little sheet of paper with the lower left-hand corner folded up. I'm going to click on that, and that creates a brand new layer. Now, I'm going to turn this into another amazing piece of artwork. I'm going to grab my Color Picker, which is on the left side of the view. Did I say the lower left-hand corner here? I think I meant lower right. So if I don't know my right from my left, please um, feel free to send me an email reminding me. I did mean I was in the lower right-hand corner of the interface, but I feel like I said left for some reason. We'll just have to go with the fact that it's a little bit late for me. So now, over here on the actual left-hand side of the view, we can click on our color picker, and I'll grab some different color, like this, well, maybe something dark. 
And then let's make a frowny face. So it's almost like the faces of drama, like so. Now, how do I drag this from one document to the, to the next? It's a little tricky. Uh, to do. If I want to transfer this layer or if I have the move tool uh, which is located at the top of the tools panel, it's this little arrow with a little cross right next to it, I can move this around but one of the things the move tool allows us to do is to take something that we're currently moving and drag it onto another document. It's just we can't do that when they're tabbed like this. So what we can do is separate the two, like so. So now I have a floating window on one, and the other one's just kind of sitting there like so. I can grab my move tool, which by default is the V key, as in Victor, and you can drag like so, and you'll notice my cursor changes to a little tiny, it's got an arrow, and then a little box with a plus sign on it, and boom, it just moves it over like so. Now again, if you're still a complete Photoshop initiate and you're wondering why is this frowny face so big on the right hand side but so small on the left hand side, remember that up here at the top we're viewing this first document at a zoom factor of 50%. So we can change that back to 100 either in the lower left hand corner of the document or up here in the application bar at the very top we have a zoom level. We can click the drop down and choose 100% and that gets us all the way back. So that's a look at creating a brand new document inside of Photoshop at the various settings you can find within. And then as you create them, the various tabs that appear, the information that appears as a part of those tabs. And with that, that is going to wrap up this video. Thanks a lot.